Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Um, I am here with Dr. Kelly and Dr. Curry, who will also introduce themselves and tell them tell you guys a little bit about themselves. But we're here again for the second part of our series of the Money Talk series. You guys saw the conversation we had earlier with a bunch of amazing medical students. Now we have some like well-established physicians who are on their journey and continuing to be on their journey. And we're gonna talk to us a little bit about like money, what is involved with being in, you know, the medical field and things like that. So I'm really excited. Stay tuned. And yeah, we're gonna get started. Uh, Dr. Curry, would you mind kind of like just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, I'm so excited to be here to have this conversation. I am a podiatrist, I'm a surgeon, and I'm based out of Atlanta. I've been in private practice for almost 11 years now, about 10 and a half years. Um, so I've been a little bit of the ups and downs. I feel like I'm a semi-seasoned uh, a private practice uh, surgeon. And so I've kind of seen what works, what doesn't work. Um, and I've enjoyed my profession so far. Um, it's, been really, it's been really great. I've been in, with it, within the same practice for the entire time of my career, which is not common. Um, most people do change different um, positions that they work for or hospital or private practice or different routes. But for me, I've been in the same practice the entire 10 years. Thank yeah. you so much for that, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Oh, yes. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for this invite. Um, my name is Dr. Toya Kelly, and I'm a family physician. I am active duty and currently stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I have no complaints there. I, um, unlike my um, friend, Dr. Curry, um, I have definitely had several different positions throughout this tenure. Um, I would say I've been in practice maybe just a little under 15 years now um, at this point, and I have had several different positions in different locations throughout the country. Um, and I'm ready to jump into this, this topic because it is truly dear to my heart. Um, I, I wish I had this conversation so much earlier um, in my journey. I'm not sure it would have changed anything, but I would have um, had more understanding. You know, I think we should always make informed decisions. As a primary care physician, I am always educating the patient, helping them understand um, what we're talking about, what the diagnosis is, what the management plan is. And so education is key. And if you understand it, then you can make the best decision for you, yourself, your family. So let's let's jump in yes you have like hit the nail on the head for me it was like i know like this is going to be a costly expenditure but like mm -hmm. i think the thing for me was going into it i like had no i like i think like looking at the tail end like i keep saying it i look at this number and i'm like who did not know we were going to be over there so like just i think being informed about like what we're going into, I think is the most important part. So I hope we can dive right into it. Like we can mm -hmm. start off with kind of saying like, how did, you know, first of all, how much, if you don't mind sharing, are you kind of at like, what does your financial journey look like throughout this, this route of going through like, you know, your p current position at the moment? Yeah, well, for me, um, I started off with undergrad, I had a full scholarship for undergrad. So that was a big help in not having undergrad loans to deal with. Um, so when it came to medical school, I pretty much just kind of jumped in and, and signed the papers, kind of whatever they handed me. It was like, this is what you need, this is how much you need, this is where you get the money from, we set up this for you. And I'm like, okay, it sounds like you all do this on a regular basis. <laughs> so I'm gonna trust the administrators of the school to, to lead me in the right direction. Um, to sign up for loans. So I pretty much had all uh, federal loans. I didn't really have any private loans. Um, so I, I'm currently now at 140,000 loans. I think I started at around 200,000. So over the years, I have um, uh, put some loans together, got cut up, uh, paid off a few, like smaller ones here or there. Um, but then as interest, late, interest rates change, you know, you may put some loans together, um, to make a lower payment or different payments. Um, so yeah, I currently have a um, 30 year. I think well, I think the last time I did it, it was still a 30 year. 
um, loan um, for mine. So yeah, I'm still at a right around 140,000. Yeah, it's a nice little chuck. I I wish I could say I only started at two hundred something thousand. That that sounds like a dream. Uh, <laughs> you know, I I think that uh, for me, I am a pretty decisive individual. You know, I made a decision to be a physician right around four years of age, and kind of just went, you know, full force ahead um, at that point, and felt like I was in school year round since the age of eight. And you know, my parents were just like, "You're going to be that doctor. It's a bit, it's a, an investment in yourself, and you're just going to keep going." I don't think anyone ever really talked about the cost. And very much like um, Dr. Curry, I got a full ride to undergrad, um, and I chose that undergrad because you know they had a program for medical school. So I'm a, like, again, I make decisions based off of pros and cons. There were several schools that I was interested in. Um, Morgan State happened to be the um, undergraduate uh, school of choice because it was a historically black college and university that was super important to me and because it had an early medical school selection program. Um, and it, it actually had two programs, one for University of Maryland Medical School and one for Boston University School of Medicine. And so I didn't know a whole lot about those programs before applying to Morgan, but I knew that they had them established and that people had gone through them. So I, I think when you're of this mindset of, I'm just gonna go straight through, I'm gonna just push through. You're young, you don't have a whole lot of experience. Um, when you're one of the first in your family to do it, no one else has experience to talk to you about it. So you just keep going. And because I didn't have to deal with undergraduate loans because I had a full scholarship, it wasn't at the top of my mind to ask these questions, to be concerned about, about the cost of things. So I, I don't know that I, I thought about it much. I didn't consider the price of it. I just, people always said, you know, it's okay. You, you, you're going to pay this amount to go to school. You need the education. So you just have to pay it and you just keep going. So I just signed my life away and just kept, kept pushing. <laughs> you know? Essentially. Yeah. I, I didn't think twice about it. I was just like, okay. And Boston University at the time, um, that was the medical school that I went to, was one of the most expensive medical schools in the world at the time. Like it, like it was not number one in, necessarily in education. It was high, ranked high um, up there, but you know, it, the two didn't correlate. It wasn't like this is the best school and this is the most expensive school. No, it was, this is a great school and it's the most expensive, you know? And so um, I, 50, it was about 56,000 a year, um, you know, and when you add that up, that becomes quite a bit, you know? So at the end of it, at the end of the day, I um, left about 300 something thousand um, in debt, and that quickly escalated to about three hundred and fifty thousand before I, before I knew it. And um, fortunately, I was able to pay off all of my student loans last year. So I am I'm very grateful <laughs> for that. That was the biggest um, uh, raise I was I'm ever going to give myself. Right. So it doesn't matter what job, what I do, there's no, there's no way I could ever make that amount of money overnight like I did once I paid it off. So I'm super excited about that. And I, I get a little shy talking about it because during the COVID pandemic, a lot of people struggled and suffered a lot. A lot of physicians struggled and suffered a lot. And I, um, I have a lot of sympathy for my, for my peers, for my counterparts. And I, being that I'm active duty and working for the government, I had a very secure paycheck. And because everything was on lockdown, I saved a lot too. So I was able to actually save during the pandemic where a lot of people struggled. And so I, I, I'm shy to say that I paid them off, but I am very proud of myself for being able to do that. So it, it's kind of, um, it catch you know catches catch can but I but I I'm ready to dive into how I did that and and how that's made such a difference in my life today so 
Yeah, she's and shy to talk to about it, but I'm gonna always like, yes, my best friend. Round of like, applause. <laughs> I saw her do it. That's amazing. <laughs> and she should be all the way applauded for doing it because that was a huge feat. To um, a lot of sacrifice we talked about over the years, and a lot of big changes she had to make. And but she's like I said, she set her mind to it, and she made it happen. So I'm always definitely proud of her for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. You you know, I think that um, when we talk about the cost of medical school, see, on average, you know, according, there's statistics and everything out there, and they say on average is about $215,000 that um, students are graduating with, medical students are graduating in medical school debt um, at this point. And that sounds about consistent. I mean, you know, some of us are on the higher end, others are on the lower end, but kind of consistently right there in that middle, $200,000 just for medical school. I think it's important to recognize that I didn't have undergrad debt. Dr. Curry and I didn't have undergrad debt. And if, if you had that, that's super important. I think, you know, there are terms that we, that we need to understand, I think, especially... I like to talk to, to my people of color. I, I feel like there are terms that we don't necessarily have the best understanding about. And a, a lot of that has to do with the difference between the federal loans and the private loans. And, mm -hmm. you know, federal loans, oftentimes people are getting for undergrad. You're thinking like, oh, I want to go to the best undergrad out there. And that may come, I don't always take the full scholarship. So then you take loans at that point. Once you start taking the, on the subsidized loans from the federal government, you start your cap, right? There's a cap that the federal government tells you that you can only have this amount of subsidized loans. Subsidized loans say that the government is going to subsidize that interest while you're in school. Mm -hmm. That's super important because if you start taking unsubsidized loans or private loans during undergrad, that's four years where your interest is daily compounding. Let's talk about it. <laughs> daily <laughs> compounding. <laughs> and then you go to medical school. And if it takes you a couple of years, a post back, a master's in between undergrad and medical school, when you started that day <laughs> one at undergrad, it is still daily compounding, okay? And that's super important. And, and I, I think there are other costs to medical school too, right? Like it's not just the, the education, it's not even just the living expenses. I mean, during this time, you may get married, you know, you may have kids, you may buy a house, you might buy a car. All of this is debt, like debt. Yeah. What, well, debt. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, it never goes away it's like it's always going to be something lingering over you um but yeah it's like it's more than just the tuition and the living expenses you know it's of course and y'all we all know in fourth year you do a lot of traveling so you have to account for that traveling to different your different externships and things like that so there's more money and no one's really working you know that little side job you have is, is maybe get you something to eat here and there but it's not paying for that plane ticket or that road trip <laughs> to go to five states away. Um, so, yeah, it's a lot of things to think about. Even in the beginning of medical school, preparing for that fourth year, you know, setting some money aside if you are working, you know, kind of starting that nest egg so that when you get to fourth year, you are not using credit cards just to survive. And, you know, I can definitely say that was one thing I didn't really have. I didn't have the other credit cards. I mean, I've had a store credit card, you know, Express or whatever was the hot thing back in the day, you know, but I didn't have like major credit cards. So I was using for gas, you know, or for or for eating, you know. So there's that other debt as well that we can't forget about um, those little things that start adding up. Um, but yeah, so like my my debt I have and then we, okay, she said you get married and then if your spouse has school debt as well, now you're both paying on something. So it's still more money coming out of that one pile that you're, you know, that you're working with. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of factors to think about, but nothing to scare you from your end goal, you know, because like she said, my I want to be a doctor since I was five. My mom bought me a doctor's kit for Christmas. So it was always ingrained in me, this is what I want to do. 
this is what you know the plan is but as you're going through that route of high school and, and undergrad and deciding on what profession you want to go into that they can be in the back of your mind as well as well what's the average salary of this particular field you know if you're going to go into debt and go to the most expensive medical school ever are you going to be in a field that's going to be able to equal out you know, um, like for me, I'm a, I'm a podiatrist, you know, podiatrist, I may do similar surgeries to orthopedic surgeons, but I don't get paid the same as orthopedic surgeons. Mm -hmm. And so I knew that going in because I educated myself on podiatry, but I knew that's the route I wanted to go. You know, podiatry school is its own separate school versus medical school, allopathic school. So I knew once I stepped into that Temple University of Podiatry, this was, this was my route. I could veer off to do OBGYN if I wanted to. You know, I was going to be below the knee <laughs> in the hall. So I had to be committed to it. And knowing that, you know, the reimbursements and not knowing that kind of stuff early on, but just kind of hearing and talking to and having those mentors and shouting podiatrists early on and realizing, you know, this is kind of how things work and this is how you might get paid. And, you know, everyone's kind of shy about, you know, talking about how much money they make. You know, as a physician, you know, people just think oh, our physicians are rich. You know, we just have money oozing off of tr trees in the backyard or something. <laughs> but we don't. Uh, but it's all of, it's, it's, a, it's a political game, yeah. you know, about how we get paid and, you know, where the money comes from and how to keep the lights on. If you're going to be a private practice doctor or if you're going to work for a hospital and how you get paid and, and going into which field you're going to go into and how they also get paid. So I think that's a big factor to consider. When you're thinking about how much money you're going to owe in the end, well, how much money can I make to pay this money back as well? Yeah, I was. Oh, I was going to ask, like, you know, how much does you know the specialty that you choose? How much should that play a role in kind of like whether mm -hmm. you go into that specialty? Like, do you feel like if it doesn't make that much money, like I know, like there's always a debate between like primary care and like, you know, specializing and then like your surgical specialties, like some people go through it for the money only. Some people go for like the balance of like having the interest as well as, I mean, hey, as a, it also makes a lot of money, but then like how, like how did you come about the decision? Because I know, yeah, we were talking a little bit about that. You know, I laugh um, because Dr. Craig, she hit it on the head. I, I say, she, you know, um, she said uh, about choosing that specialty and how we just, a lot of people think that doctors are just super rich. Like we just have all this money. Maybe we have a money tree in the backyard. And and I think when, when you're going into it, your family is just pushing you and they're like, Oh, you have to do it. Do it for the culture. You know, you got to get out there, carry carry this this um this plight on your shoulders, and you're it's gonna be great because you're gonna make so much money, and that's that's not necessarily true. You do make decent money, um, and so which is which is super important. I mean, I, I definitely needed a profession that would support my habits. I mean, let's face it. Like I, you know, <laughs> I needed something that was going to um, be worthwhile, right? So you, it, it is a huge commitment. And, um, and so I, I initially wanted to be a dermatologist. And so I, at, at that point, I keep saying back then, and I'm re recognizing how long I've been in this game or how old I'm getting, but, but anyway, so at that point, um, they called it the road to success. I'm not sure if they still do that. Lillian, do they still call it the road to success? Whereas radiology, oncology, anesthesiology, dermatology, you know, those are the special. Yeah, I've heard of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that make really decent money, have great hours, um, but they can also be the hardest to get into. Um, and I remember just being, like I said, I'm doing derm. It was super important to me. Um, and so I, all of my mentors were in dermatology. And so I was like, well, I need to go to a great school who's good, who's known for matching on the first go, right? So that was super important to me. Like when you're, when, even though I said like Morgan State had these programs, so that meant that I needed to research the schools, right? And so, you know, I didn't go just because they had a program. I went because the program, the school they had the program with um, met my goals at the time, right? And so at, at that time to train in New England, like I, 
was an ultimate. Like I wanted to be trained by those who are on CNN talking, who are, you know, publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine. I, I, I wanted the best of the best, right? And I, I didn't want to have to explain my degree, tell anybody. I said I graduated from here, and everybody shuts up. Like, okay, got it. Dr. Kelly knows what she's talking about, <laughs> and so. That was, that was my goal at the time. So Boston University made sense. And so the, the way that program worked, you apply during your sophomore year and you just, you get in and you go straight through, okay? And so it doesn't take off a year. So it's still four and four, but it, um, you get an early acceptance and there's a lot of support throughout the way. Um, but that being said, again, I went to that school knowing it was super expensive, but also with the idea that I was going to go into dermatology. And then in my very last rotation, I had family medicine. And um, as a third year, and it was right before the everything needed to be in, and I switched. I switched without telling anybody. I just, let me just put this in here. Like, and so... Um, when I finally did come back, my parents were like, wait, what, wait, and my counselors, my, my mentors, wait, family, you're going to go into primary care? I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I love it. I, I, I learned how to use this stethoscope. I, I need to keep using it. I, I like talking to patients and helping them. I'm really good with prevention. And I, I we, we need us. We, we need to be out there and I want my parents and my grandparents and my kids to be, to go to the best primary care docs out there and let's do it. So that's what I'm going to do. And they were like, you just cut your salary in half. Why did you do that? You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, at the, at the end of the day, it was absolutely the best decision I could have ever made. You know, there were times in my career where I had to be on bed rest for more than six months. And with this career, I was able to work from home and not miss a paycheck. You know, at the time, had I been in Durham, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, they, you know, this pandemic has taught us that everybody can figure out how to work from home. But at that time, that was not the case. And so, you know, um, we would have been on our behind out on the street because we bought that house based on both of our salaries, not just, you know, on one person's salary. And so if I had us been sat down, it would have been a struggle. So, um, you know, I, you make decisions that are that best suit you, not anybody else, because there are going to be a lot of people that are going to tell you, you should do this, or we need you to do that, or, you know, but if you're not passionate about it, you shouldn't go into medicine, A, because it's a long haul. Um, and B, you're gonna, you know, it's, it's you, you gotta get up every day, you know, and, and do this. And it's, when we talk about the commitment, it's not, just a time, it's not just a financial commitment, it is a time commitment, right? And that time commitment doesn't stop once you finish your 11 years, right? Four years of undergrad, four years of medical school and three years of a residency or six years of a residency. It doesn't stop at that point. The time commitment are long hours as an attending. And the way these residencies are set up these days, you know, you can only work for so many hours at a time. That attending life does not stay that, okay? You want that money? You, your patient is out there, you will get up when that baby needs to be born, you will, you know, go to the nursing home and pronounce someone dead, you will go and catch a bit, you will go and help a, pedi a pediatric patient if a surgery needs to be done. There was many times I've seen Dr. Curry get up in the middle of the night and, and go and handle that. And so the, the commitment doesn't stop. So you have to be passionate about it. Um, but, but the financial rewards can be there. You know, there are ways to make it work. It may, there are ways to make it work really well. So, I mean, we can get into that a little bit later too. But yeah, so there's, there's the financial debt piece, but there's also the earning potential. So. Right, yeah, that's definitely there. I, was, I was remember when I was early on, and even in medical school, um, some attendants would always say, you may, may not be, rich but you'll be comfortable and that was always in the back of my mind it's like you, you're not going to if with the salary you can make you won't be hurting for money you shouldn't be for the most part um of course things happen pandemics you know make depressions in the economy all that kind of stuff happen 
Um, but for the most part, you can be comfortable. And, and also to consider there are some things we have no idea are coming, like the way um, billing and things have changed over the years. Right now, the, the major change they made this year in 2021, the way that we get paid, I'll, I'll ultimately get paid more on certain codes because I will bill them more, but like a cardiac, cardiac, cardiac surgeon, because they're going to cut back on procedure reimbursement, so we end up getting paid less. So you may go into this thinking, oh, I'm going to do these huge open heart surgeries and I'm going to get paid all this money. Well, 10 years from now, if the government decides to change and the insurance company decides to change how they, how they pay us, you may actually end up getting paid less than you think. And so you have to go into medicine for something you love and not because of the money, because you will quickly get your feelings hurt <laughs> on multiple levels if you're going into it for the money, because there are different things that are going to happen that you just have no idea are going to come. Um, so, yeah, like I, that's been a big, a big hit, a big change. For us in podiatry in particular, it's benefited us, this major change they made about how they pay for office visits versus procedures. Um, and so we'll ultimately get paid more. It's like now I can I can bill higher codes that I was not allowed to bill for as a specialist. Um, but then someone on the flip side may get paid less for that that knee, knee replacement. You know, so you have to, you, those things you don't know are gonna come, but if you still love doing knee replacements, then you're gonna be okay. But you may get paid a little bit less because you're gonna help somebody walk. You know, so the debt piece and the financial piece of it are huge, but your happiness is the biggest part of it. You have to go into this knowing I'm committed to this for the next 20 or 30 years or however long you want to practice. And am I going to be happy doing this for the rest of my life? Some form of it. You may switch it up, different things, academics or whatever, but some form of it will you be happy doing it. And if you can say yes, then sign the dotted line and keep on going. I think that's key, what you just stated. Like it, you have to go into it knowing that you're going to do it for a, a minimum amount of time. Like you're like if you're not gonna do this for at least 20 years or more, this is not the profession. Like mm-hmm. it, because of the commitment up front, that time commitment we just talked about, you can't go into this like, oh, I'm just gonna do this for a, a couple of years and I'm gonna go in and just do real estate. Like you you have to go into it knowing I'm gonna do some form of medicine for a couple decades or more, you know, um, and, and, and be fine with that. I, I'm of the mindset of retiring right at 55. Like I, I, you know, I don't want to work a day after that. And, um, and I'm okay with that. I'm setting myself up to do that, you know? And so if you, if you set yourself up the appropriate way to, to start your, your net worth and to understand, start, tucking stuff away, preparing for that future, depending on what you want to do. Yeah, we could all be millionaires in here and have started from scratch, you know, like I, many of us start from scratch, right? So many of us don't have a, a pile of money waiting on us when when we, you know, turn 18. Many of us don't inherit some extra this, that, and the fourth, you know, um, so we start from scratch. And so, but there are ways to start from scratch and still have net worth of millions if you do it right you know so um it, it's possible but you can't go into it like oh i'm gonna pay get in the debt this much and then only work for five years as a physician yeah <laughs> you can put it on the side <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that yeah. Yes, wrong. yeah i definitely wanted to kind of like move kind of dive dive a little deeper because I know we were talking about earlier on um it sounds like we have like two different pathways in doing it because Dr. Kelly you mentioned that you already paid off your um loans in terms of being I guess I don't want to use the word aggressive I'm sure that but like something that you're like paying it all the way up front versus I know Dr. Curry we're talking about maybe like this might be something that a little more long term so can, can you talk a little bit more about how you kind of came to those decisions what are the motivations behind it? Because I'm still going back and forth about whether I want to go aggressive or just like, just, you know, because I mean, that is like a financial plan, right? Like just kind of laying it all out. And like, it's just one other cost that you do because you have other debts like we talked about earlier. So how did you guys kind of go about making that decision? Uh, Dr. Kelly, what have you been done to like go really aggressive and like get to that point? And like, what other things should we know? Well, I'm, I think I'm going to let um, Dr. Curry go first because I, I started 
the path that that she that she's doing right like I think that was um that was my thought process I was always told the debt is going to be there so just pay it off you pay what you can when you can and, and it'll just it'll be fine it is what it is um because because of life right so you have to keep living life and so I I started that way so I'm gonna let I'm going to let her talk first and then I can tell you why I switched. Um, but I definitely understand being on that path. So, <laughs> yeah. So like she said, kind of the more traditional path of, you know, your, your debts are there. Um, you may consolidate them into multiple, into one solid loan. Um, so yeah, so that's been kind of my path. You know, I've altered it here or there based on interest rates, um, payment plans, um, different options based on what I could afford. You know, you put loans into forbearance or deferment for a certain amount of time when you're in residency, keeping in mind that those interest rates are still compounding, even though you're not paying on it. I can say like my co-resident at the time, she was paying the interest on her loans um, when we were in residency. So she didn't have that interest compounded on top of the principal of the loan we finished where I wasn't just because of my financial standards and where I was with my parents and having to help people and whatnot. So there's always that option to make sure you keep that in mind. And even if you're not paying on the principal because you may be only making a minimum amount in residency, if you can pay a few hundred, you know, on the principal every month, then that will all definitely add up in the end once those three or four years are over. Um, so I've consolidated loans over the years and, and made it into one payment that's comfortable for me now. Um, it did the different payments plans that they offer. Um, but at the at the certain point, they're like, okay, you have no more forbearance. Your your six months are up, <laughs> your 36 you whatever many months they give you is up, you know. So um here's what here's what you have and when you when do you want to start? And I was like, well, I guess I just gotta give in and <laughs> give this money up. I can't keep pushing it back any further. Um so yeah, so that's where I am with mine. And it is it's one of those things where it's just one of those payments where it's at one point, it was more than my mortgage. I was like, I'm paying more for loans than I am for this house. <laughs> um, and so that's where it, it hits you when it's like that check or an automatic debit that comes out every month um, is there. But it's gotten to a point now, like I said, like 10 years out from residency, and it's just got, I'm comfortable with it. You know, I, I'll look at it every so often and I'll make sure I'm at, at the lowest interest rate possible. Dr. Dr. Kelly and I share a financial advisor. So he'll every so often send an email and say, you know, by the way, the interest loans are down. You want to check on consolidate? And I said, okay, let me check and see where I stand. You know, if it makes sense um, and, and changing up some payments, then we will. Um, but my husband, you know, he has his own set of student loans from uh, from undergrad and master's and, um, you know, post-secondary school and whatnot. So we are, we've kind of made a plan on, you know, tackling his loans. And once you've gotten down the other secondary debt and, you know, car notes, that kind of stuff, we'll tackle his loans because his are significantly less than my, like a third of mine. Um, and then if it gets to the point where once that's paid off, the extra money didn't go to my loans, you know, so we, we kind of have a plan for it, but it's not one of those things where it's, I, I don't lose sleep over that loan payment that's coming out because it's just kind of a part of life for me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, for, for me, we, you know, she talks about our, about our husband um, and, and I think that's super important, right? And so when I went into this, um, I wasn't married, you know, it was, it was just me. So I was making decisions for me. Um, and then I met my husband who um, is also an active duty soldier and um, he didn't have student debt. And so... <laughs> When, when you are trying to get married and somebody's like, wait, you, what? Like, okay, so what? <laughs> you know, you're, you're in this, in this, okay, so in the, in the premarital counseling, you're finding out all kind of stuff. You're like, oh, so you have 300, how much money in debt? So we have to pay that every month? And so then you're like, oh, okay, so it's not just me anymore. And you know, when, when, when the other person has a different view of debt, um, and, and how, you know, we plan to live our life as a family, 
um, it's important to consider. And I think it just gave me um, different perspectives um, and, and different intentions. And so, yeah, I got gazelle intense. Um, Dr. Curry and I, if, if you can't tell, that, that is my bestie. And so <laughs> we've, we've grown up together since fourth grade and um, have done just about everything together. And so um, when I was pregnant with my oldest, who is now eight, um, again, that was when I was on bed rest um, for six months. And I, I think I got a wake up call. Like, you know, we could be homeless. Like, I mean, we had somewhat of a savings, but um, not really. And at that time, my student loan payment was about 1500 a month. Um, and that's a significant chunk. And you can defer, you can forbear, but that does give out at some point. And there's nothing that takes away the student loan debt besides death. And so that rings in my ear, <laughs> like, okay. So, you know, regardless of whether I have it or not, they're gonna take this money. Um, and we couldn't live like that for, as, for our family. So every family is different. You're, everybody's just decisions are different. But at that point, um, we decided to read um, a, a Dave Ramsey book, and I'm, I don't, I don't, he doesn't pay me anything, so I'm not going to go into all of that. But what it did was it, it changed my perspective a lot on debt and debt management. Um, and so, you know, in the book, he calls it gazelle intense, and so that's that aggression that you're talking about. And at that point, I, we just got aggressive. We we started with a true plan to pay it off, and. Um, and that included selling a house, that, in, that included downsizing, that included moving, that included um, really looking, because I wasn't, all, I've only been active duty now for about five and a half years. So I started off as a civilian um, making pretty good money. And because he was active duty, I had gone through the government route at, at one point. And, you know, for those who do know, I, be, I went up to a GS-15, you know, level, which is the highest level in the government system. So um, I was, I had pretty significant um, positions in the government as a civilian and got paid fairly, fairly well for that. Um, however, the, it didn't come with any student loan repayment. I didn't um, add that into my uh, salary negotiations. And, and you can, I, I want to encourage people to, to do that up front. You know, there are, even in the government, some government positions will offer um, student loan repayment. And so a, a lot of physicians, you know, don't know how to negotiate. So I, I really suggest leaning into that and negotiating your salary up front and really um, making sure that whatever sign on bonuses you get, that needs, the plan should be to pay it pay down on either at least the interest on your student loans. And so really be focused on it, have an actual plan. And I didn't have an actual plan besides just paying my minimums. And that, that wasn't doing enough um, for us. And then when that minimum is still $1,500, like what in the world? Like I, I'm paying a minimum of $1,500 and I would be paying this for 30 years. By that point, I will, you know, my kids will be in school and, you know, they they will have weddings and they will have, and I, you know, I just, I, it, it overwhelmed me at one point. And so I was just like, I, this needs to be paid off. So we got to a point where, you know, I was paying up to $3,500 a month um, just on, just on the student loans. And so um, by the time I paid that off, I mean, who's going to give you a $3,500 raise a month? You know, so that's what we see extra. Now that's our money, you know, is, is I don't have to pay it to somebody else. And so it made sense to me. So what, what I did was, you know, um, almost six years ago now, I decided that I was going to go active duty. And that's a, diff a difficult decision to make at that age, right? Because active duty is for the young at heart, trust me. And not just the young at heart, it's for the youth. It's, it's like <laughs> my husband raised his hand at 17. That's a big difference when you're in your 30s, raising your hand to do some basic training and go into um, active duty. But at, at that point, I, it, I went, my first duty station was in the Bureau of Prison. And that came with the HIPSA score, a health professions shortage, I forget what the A stands for, but the HIPSA score tells you, 
you know, um, if it's in a, your a vulnerable population, a disadvantaged area. And so they're willing to pay you to, to go there. And so I also, at the same time of going active duty, apply for the National Health um, Service Loan Repayment Program, which at the time came with a two-year commitment for $50,000. And that was tax-free. Now, I want to say that, uh, again, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised from Atlanta, and I went to um, Morgan State in Baltimore. And, you know, we as a people, we, you know, and from Atlanta and Baltimore, we're, we're really hung up on how we look and dress and what cars we ride and what kind of house we have. And, and I, I kind of fell in line with that. So I, I had the credit card deck because I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. I, I had, you know, I, I bought my first car and my first house because everybody else, all of my other friends had had that. So I, my husband was like, well, you know, you got credit card, you, you got, you, okay, so tell me again what's happening. <laughs> and so it was, it was a, I needed to change my mindset. I needed to get out of all of that debt. And so to, to sit here today and be debt free, to have, you know, no car notes, to have um, no student loans, to have no credit card debt, it, it is uh, a uh, amazing feeling and I, I wish it for everyone. I, I wish it for everyone because you know we are on our way now to making our first net million um, much sooner than, than we had thought and, and that's what we need, right? We need to be able to um, help our generations not start from scratch and to build generational wealth so that our kids, kids can actually dream without the risk of failure, that's when you know you've made it. We don't have that option. My kids right now don't actually have that option. They actually can't dream without the risk of failure because they can't fail because we ain't made it that far yet. But, we, but hopefully their kids will be able to do that. And that's because we won't start from scratch. And so it was really important for me to get the debt out the way so that I could start building wealth. And so um, that's kind of how I did it. I did the $50,000 that was tax free. So that went straight to the student loans. And then um, because I went active duty, uh, my salary, I did take a big salary cut going from civilian to active duty. But the, also the difference was is that I was in Augusta, Georgia at the time where the quality of living is a little bit different, the standard of living. So we were able to live off of his salary. And then um, my salary, most of it wasn't taxed because we get a lot of tax-free benefit salary as an active duty. And, and so that helped. So I, it didn't feel as bad, even though it may have been more than $40,000 cut, pay cut. Um, it didn't feel like that because where we were living and because of the tax-free benefits. And so then we downsized um, into a much smaller home. And we went from 6,000 square feet of home in DC to 1,500 square feet of home in Augusta, Georgia. That's a, a, a big difference. Um, so we sacrificed um, and made that commitment to each other to just pour everything we could. I, I took extra jobs. I did telemedicine um, for a while and everything I made from that I put um, onto the student loans. Um, I, um, I started a, a side gig, which I, I do. Um, I have a travel agency because I love to travel on a budget, but I love to travel in style and luxury. And so there are so many people like that. So um, it was a great field for me um, to, to go into and, and everything that I make from that went onto my student loans. And so it, that's just kind of um, how, how we did it. We paid off credit card first then we um, went towards the student loans. And so, so it, it was actually 13 years from the time that I graduated to the time that I paid it off, but it was really the last seven years that I was focused on, on paying that off. Thank you so much. There's just so many, so much that was said. I feel like kind of going back into like, I think for me, because I don't have a family or like right now or like all that thing, it's like hard for me to like realize that other people may come into my life and there may be other perspectives that may play a role and like my debts will be also my partner's debt. So like that will play a role in how that's going to be paid off. Um, 
you kind of talked about like you know not trying to keep up with the joneses kind of a thing like if you are even if you are like going the more the less aggressive route like you also have to like live kind of within your means or under your means if you want to like if you're if you have that mindset of wanting to pay off your loans so yeah a lot of stuff was touched on you talked about nhsc i think that was the national health service corps um kind of like uh you know, serving and being a part of the army and how that may have helped as well in terms of how you paid off your loans too. I was also wondering if any of, like, if you knew of additional resources, like for, you know, pre-meds or medical students at the at this well, point right make, now. I want to make a correction. I'm in the United States Public Health Service. So the Surgeon General has his own service. And so I joined the Public Health Service because that's where my my heart was, right? And so whenever okay. there's a public health emergency like COVID, a Zika, a hurricane, um, I, I'm deployed for those things. And so it, it fit my passion and my love to help our people and to serve our people. So I went into the public health service. My husband is army. Um, and Sorry so- that, yeah. Um, no, so, but in, in, that, in saying that, I, I, I never thought about going military. Um, and so I, so what I was trying to say about also being from Atlanta and going into Baltimore, I honestly, just to be real, just to keep it 100, like I thought that I was just too cute to kind of do any of that, right? I'm just, I, I, <laughs> I can't, what do you mean I can't wear nails? What do you, what do you mean that you're going to tell me how to wear my hair? What, what, what are you talking about? Like I, and then to go into a prison, like who, who's doing that? Like I, like, I, I surprised everybody, I think, when I told them I was going <laughs> to go into a, um, to the, into correct the medical. Secretary's in agreement here. I questioned it many times. Was like, I, I, do you need to be an examined? Are we sure? Really? Uh, same person I grew up with. Are we sure? A prison. Yes. Like real prisoners. A, a medium <laughs> security. Uh, yes, a medium security male only prison. Yeah. And, um, and, and I actually loved it. I actually love it. This physician who was only about women and child health went into a male only prison because it came with $50,000 of student loan repayment. And I'm like, sign me up. But I, <laughs> I went in and I actually ended up loving it. And I'm still in correctional medicine and still love it to, to this day. And so you just really never know. So I, I always say keep a yes mindset and be open-minded about what it is that you um, um, want to do and need to do to best fit your, your needs. Um, but I, I also say that um, had I put a little bit more thought into it and not have been, um, for me, not everybody's like this, but for me, I was a little superficial. I didn't know much about the military and just didn't think that it was for me. Um, and, and so I didn't even think about the health professions, um, the HP, HPSP, um, which is what you can get that right at the beginning of medical school and join, you know, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Public Health Service. And they will pay off your your medical school, so you don't even get the debt. It, it's paid for you as you go, and they even give you a stipend to 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 go to school and everything. They pay for books and and all of that, and you you owe them back. Each service may be a little different, so I'm not going to go into specifics. But the HPSP scholarship is an option out there, and you you owe that service back um, a year per per year that you take, or maybe it's more depending on that service. Um, but I, sometimes I wish that I had just done that. I wish I had done that up front. Who pays you to go to medical school? I mean, where, 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 does, where does that happen? And, um, and I, I think that that, like if I, if, if I had been a true planner, you know, I, I would have sat down and, and maybe even considered going to um, something like um, West Point or one of the, you know, service Ivy League schools for undergrad, um, and then gone into UCS, the, the Uniform Services University for medical school. Um, they, that's such a, just like other Ivy Leagues, it comes, that background that you're affiliated with has a lot of weight. I mean, that connection is real. And so not only were you not paying for undergrad, you don't pay for medical school, you've made connections that can keep your kids' kids in line forever. Like, and so those connections that are there are amazing. And so if that's something that's for you, you have to get on the, cause it's hard to get, you know, into one of those military schools. So you, you have to get on the ball with that really early. 
um, and try and do that. And if you don't go the military route for undergrad and you've decided at medical school, that's a good time to, to do that as well. And now that they've changed their retirement process, um, where you don't really have to do the whole 20 years to start getting um, retirement pay, I think it's really important to consider, you know, and I love it. I love what I do, you know. Um, I think a lot of us get concerned about deployments and stuff. In the public health service, you know, we're an unarmed service. So we're not um, deploying to war zones. However, my husband would say he would rather deploy to Iraq in a war zone than to deploy and fight Ebola, something you can't see, you know. So uh, you take it what you take what you want. But at the end of the day, um, I love to serve my country and that HPSP is an option that's there. Um, and we already talked about the National Health Service Loan um, Scholarship. I, I also want to say, but I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna shut up because I can talk a lot. But there, <laughs> one of the other things that I that I did consider um, because we're from Georgia, Georgia at the time had this like rule: if you would go um, to a rural area in Georgia and and come back to practice, then they would um, do the loan repayment or they would pay it up front. Because I wasn't sure if I was gonna come back to Georgia, I didn't want to take the scholarship up front. Um, but I, I did keep in my mind the loan repayment option. And when I ended up doing my residency um, at the Medical College of Georgia um, in Augusta, I was like, oh, this is perfect. I can just get the Georgia loan repayment. Of course, I ended up getting married and moving away. So I wasn't able to take that option. And so that's life. That, here again, we talk about how we can make all the plans in the world, but then life actually happens. Um, but, but I'm saying that to say that there are plenty of local city and state um, scholarship options that are there. You just need to network and figure out what's around. There are churches that are there. There are hospitals that have things that are available for you. You just have to do the legwork and, and really sit down, network with people. There are Greek organizations, um, like the Divine Nine Greek Letter organizations that are out there that will um, maybe have some scholarships to help with medical school. So start, start smaller because those people will know your name and it'll be e the competition should be a little bit less before you start going to the, to the larger national scholarship options. Um, but there, there are definitely some out there. You know, I know that the AAMC, the American um, Academy of Medical Colleges, they have scholarships that are out there. Um, and the AMA, the American Medical Association um, gives a fourth year medical student scholarship every year. Um, and so there's, there's definitely scholarships out there um, and those $5,000, $10,000 scholarships are helpful. So, so mm -hmm. take Yeah, and I will say that for me, since I did podiatry, it was actually a little bit different for me because DPM was a different field than allopathic medicine. So some of my options were limited. So I actually considered the Navy um, going into, I don't know if you remember that. I, was in a, I had applied and everything in. At the time, my fiance and my husband now, he was like, the Navy? Like, wait a minute, this is not what we talked about. So he wasn't a fan of the whole get up and travel and move every couple of years and all that stuff. So I considered that as an option of long repayment and um, a way to get paid before rather than going into private practice. Um, so and then as far as the health professions um, route, for podiatry, it would have put me in the allied health department. So it would have put me at a different ranking than had I been an MD. So I consider that as well as a way of kind of deferring some money and loans and whatnot. Um, so I was a little more limited in my options as a podiatrist. Um, but so things may have changed and something, a lot of things have changed since I came out, um, out of residency and out of school um, because podiatry has become more well known and more recognized um, overall in the field. So we don't have that competition I mean, being put into lower levels when we shouldn't be. Um, so more of those options can be out there for those who are in podiatry as well. And I, I want to talk a little bit about loan repayment options. Scholarships are great. Sometimes scholarships are limited, unfortunately, in the medical school. Um, and, and so if you can get a scholarship, get the scholarship. that You want that. You don't want to pay for much out of pocket up front. So try and get that. And then as, as far as loans are concerned, try to go the federal loan route first. Okay. So um, with, whatever way you can make it so it's not based on your parents' income or this, that, and the four of you. It needs to be based on you. Get your um, get the federal loans first. The more subsidized loans you want, more than the unsubsidized loans. Um, most of us are going to have to get private loans um, and to to cover things, and um, and so you the interest rates become important at that point. 
And so um, I, I think it's important to, to understand that there's, there's options if you wanna um, consolidate your loans and, and, um, and then um, what's it called when you get a better interest rate? I'm, I'm blanking right now, but- Refinancing. Refinance, yeah, you wanna refinance those loans to get a better interest rate. Um, now the public health, there's a public health service loan forgiveness program. And so, um, the thing about these loan re repayment programs, though, you have to apply. It doesn't count until you apply and have been accepted. So if you've been paying your loans all this time and then you're like, oh, I'm in a field that qualifies for the public health service loan repayment. Yeah, you are. But if you didn't apply, it, it your time starts at the moment that they accept you after you apply, right? And so, don't waste time. If you know that you're going to be, if you're that you're going to be in a field or take a job that's going to work when it comes to that, then apply at the same time you apply for that job and accept that job so that it starts right away. And so, the public health service loan forgiveness program, to my understanding, I didn't do that that's 10 years and it's income based, right? So you make payments based on your income. And, um, and so you do that for 10 years and after those 10 years, then your loan, the rest of your loans are forgiven. Um, and so the big difference between that and regular income driven repayment loan plans is that after those 10 years that your what's forgiven is not taxed. But if you do a regular income driven repayment, so an IDR plan, you have to pay on those for like 20 or 25 years. And after that, then your loans are forgiven. But that year that they're forgiven, the rest is taxed, right? And so that can come with a hefty tax bill that year um, if you're not careful. So um, you, you need to really be mindful about that. So there's pros and cons for every option. And, and even though you'll do an income-driven repayment, because you're stretching out how long you're paying it, you're getting more and more interest. So you're actually paying more and more, right? And so I, I keep talking about interest because I don't think I understood it well. And so I just, I wanna just tell you this. If you get $10,000, okay? Day one, you get $10,000 and you, um, and it's gonna be compounded interest on that. Typically with student loans is daily compounded interest. Not all of them, but, but typically is day, I want to, that means every 24 hours, that, that means every day. That means I just want to make sure we understand daily. Okay, so then there's daily <laughs> interest. So if you start with 10,000 and let's just say it was 4.25% interest loan, right? So once you break that down to daily, let's say you got a dollar and 20 cents um, for that day's interest. So the next day that interest is going to come back, but now it's going to be on $10,001.20. And then you're, so now that interest is going to be, so every day it piles up. And so by the end of the year, maybe you're at 10,445, right? Um, and now you're going to, your interest starts again over 10,440. So I, I just want you to understand that you could typically double how much in 10 years, you can double how much you took, right? So if you only took 10,000, you may owe 30,000 in 10 years, okay? So yeah, I, that's key. That's what I'm saying. My, my co-resident, she was paying on her interest yeah. while we were in residency. So she took that equation out of it, that extra money, those extra $200 that would have been added on at the end of the year, she was paying on it. You know, and then that daily stuff is, it, I actually have one of my medical assistants. She took out a loan to go to medical assistant school, like $15,000. But because she's been deferring it for so many years, now she owes her $50,000. But on an MA salary, she's like, well, I won't go to the grave with that because <laughs> she's not even trying to ever even try and pay it. But because she's been deferring it for so long, it's the interest rates was just crazy on the loan she took out, on the private loan she took out for a medical assisted school that should have been something she could have easily paid off, but because she kept deferring it, the interest. And so it, it happens. Right. Yeah, so it's definitely something to, to consider. I would suggest, you know, if, if primary care, because if we were gonna, you know, be realistic about it, right? Um, you know, primary care physicians aren't paid the same as some of your, your specialties or your, your surgeons or things, if you're gonna work inner city, okay? So now if you're, if you're willing to go to a rural area, I mean, I know some, you know, family physicians 
who can bring in 350 or more, you know, especially if they're going to do procedures and still do inpatient or something like they can, they can bring in that money. But on average, your physicians are only bringing in about 200,000. And, um, and, and that, that's, that average of 200,000 is because it includes pediatricians, family physicians, psychiatrists, and it includes plastic surgeons and, and whatnot, right? And so it's always in the middle. So there's definitely people that are making a million a year. And then there's definitely people who are making 125,000 a year. Let, let's be, let's be real, right? And so, um, you know, so wherever you decide to fall, I think it's important when you're planning that, you know, it, you would say the same thing if you were going to become a teacher, right? Teacher, being a teacher is a great profession. Many of us have a whole different level of respect for teachers this year after having to homeschool and virtually um, distance learn our kids at home. And so I'm like, pay them more. What if they want, look, sign, I'm signing petitions. I'm going to the ballot, you know, let's pay be, because they're super important. But, but at, the, at the end of the day, as it stands right now, you know, if you decide to go to an Ivy League school to, to become a teacher and you're going to practice inner city and, you know, only make 40000 50000 maybe 60000 a year, that that doesn't pay for itself, right? And so it will be the same thing with medicine. Just because you're going to medical school and going to be a doctor doesn't mean that you should, you know, choose a school that's going to be super expensive if you're only planning on making this amount or living this way. You can go into a specialty and only decide to work part-time if that's your goal. You know, if that's the case, then you should plan accordingly when it comes to the types of loans you're accepting, the, the medical school you go to. Um, that's not saying choose the cheapest school out there. Most medical schools have to teach you the same thing, you know, but, but some schools are better in certain areas depending on what your goals are. So you want to be very strategic when it comes to that, you know, so you, you have to start planning. You can't just go and say, well, I'm just going to go to school and I'm just going to figure it out as I go. No, only Americans do that. You don't figure it out as you, you, you have to plan, <laughs> be strategic, okay? Um, and so I just want to make sure that, that I, that I stress that I think it's super important. And if you know, at four years old, that you want to go into medical school, then instead of our family, just pushing us to go, 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 we need to be, okay, you want to go to medical school? We're going to every, every birthday, this is what we're doing. You know, like you're, we're putting money aside for this. We're doing that. You're, you're going to be in school trying to do that. You're going to learn, you know, about investing and about, what what interest rates are you, you you have to we have to teach our kids more we have to plan better um so that we can do professions like this it's, it's super important for us to be here we need more um you know people of color and, and as physicians um it is a great field to be in i'm so grateful that i'm a physician i i love being a physician i i wouldn't choose anything else but if if you can be a physician you can be anything else Right. I mean, if you have the fortitude to continue through medical school, then you can do anything you put your mind to. So if that's the case, then put your mind to planning for it because it is a business and, and we need to treat it as such, you know, be prepared, be prepared for that. Um, and there's so many different ways to do that. So, and this is just my last, because I, I want to push primary care because I think it's super important. And um, <laughs> it, is a, it is a great field to be in and you can make money in it. And there are many options, you know? Um, and so there, there are different, there's DPC now, like direct, direct patient care where, um, you know, physicians and, and patients come together. They have like one flat fee a month or quarterly or annually. And you can pay that way. It's different from fee for service. It's different from concierge medicine. Um, it's a way to still have collaborative practice and still, but not necessarily have to deal with the insurance companies. Um, I, I'm not necessarily saying that's the only way to go. I'm just saying that there's options out there. There's options to make money um, out there. Um, you know, and so you you just have to plan for it. You have to plan for it, and you you have to um, have your financial planners. I. I pay people who know more. They went to school for this. I pay somebody to, to teach me or to help me grow my money the way I need them to grow it. And I honestly wish I had a financial planner in college. I wish I had that um, at that time so that I could better plan. We have to, if you're going to invest in yourself, you don't just invest in yourself just in medical school. You're, you're the business. Invest in yourself from the get-go. 
And that comes with financially planning from early on. And I will say with this, as far as the loans, we talked about consolidating and refinancing. And as you as you go in your career, you'll find ways of making more money or other streams of income. And that's those times when you may refinance your loans. And so I think I started off with a 30 year loan. And then as I make more money, I was able to afford to come down to a 20 year loan. I was able to afford a higher monthly payment to pay it down faster. And I looked at possibly even a 15 year loan. Because thinking about the fact that where I am now, how old my kids are, you know, I have an eight year old and five year old twins. So thinking about, okay, in 15 years, they'll all be in college and out. And do I want to be done with loans? Is that the route that that's my plan? Um, or looking at even changing our, our mortgage from a 30 year to a 15 year and using and using those means of having income in the end in retirement. So as you make money and as you continue in your career, you, you won't be stuck in a 30 year loan forever. You know, that may just where you start at the beginning because that's what you can afford, but you'll get to the point where you can pay those loans off faster and sooner with less interest because you'll have more income. And so it doesn't have to be that big of a burden for you when you think about, you know, I'll be on, on this same train when I'm 70. Like, no, you won't. <laughs> it, it will eventually end. <laughs> but if there's ways to get it to end faster if you don't have those huge loan repayment options um, like Dr. Kelly had. Yeah. And I, I think if I had any advice to, you know, just like if um, they, they, they tell you about buying your home, you know, the, the best time to help pay down your mortgage and to decrease the amount of interest is to pay an extra payment within that first year that you get your mortgage, right? And so if that's the case, do the same thing with your student loans. Make an extra payment, at least one extra payment that first year. And that, that can actually help decrease that amount of interest because again, we talked about daily interest. So I suggest making extra payments on your student loans. If you can't make an actual payment on the principal, like Dr. Curry said, definitely try and pay that interest. I think that's super important. Um, try and find ways to do that. And, you know, we, we do GoFundMe accounts for all kinds of different things. Let's be, you know, gazelle intense and focus on really trying to get at these student loans because, yeah, we can say they're just going to be there or whatever, but honestly, your life would be so different if you didn't have to worry about that, right? And so really trying to be focused about that and, and still live your life. I know there's a, there's a different thought process out there. I, I have colleagues who are like, forget them loans, right? I'm gonna pay the minimum because I'm about to live. I'm about the biggest house. I'm about the best car. I'm gonna travel where I want. Um, and, and you can do that. There's, there's, a, there's definitely different thought processes out there on how to live your life. It's what, you, it's what fits you you know, and um, that, that wasn't what fit me in my life, but I have no judgment on other people for how they want um, to live their life. And so there's, there's different options out there, but these are just suggestions that if you um, want to be financially savvy about the, the debt, because it shouldn't hold you up. That's the one thing I think that we've been saying throughout this entire time. It's so worth it to be a physician. Um, the earning potential is there, you know, so the debt is actually a small aspect of it. It's just a, an important aspect of it. It, it, is, it is something that um, can impact your life in many different ways. And so it's, you can't forget about it. So I feel like you just need to be intentional about it, but it doesn't stop you from where you're going. So if you're intentional, you would make extra payments, you would pay down the interest. Um, you know, you, I, I, I would really hesitate on deferring um, the student loans again. I, I deferred throughout residency. I didn't pay a lick. I didn't pay any interest. I didn't pay anything at all. I just put it into deferment. When that ran out, it went to forbearance. Look, I, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't plan well. And I don't, I don't, I wouldn't suggest that. Um, I would suggest paying on it, paying what you can, doing the income, um, based options as, as possible doing which getting family involved uh, something some kind of way I would I would start paying on it and I actually moon I started moonlighting as a resident making really good money moonlighting um <laughs> but I I wasn't using that to pay you know um down my student loans I I don't know what I was doing I was living life I guess I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't have any, I don't have anything tangible to show for it. That's, that's my point. That's all I'm saying is 
you know, I know tomorrow isn't promised. I get that, you know, so I would say, great, live, however, um, set yourself up and your family up, right? And so I think it's more to it. Um, look into those loan forgiveness programs, really be intentional about that, work into a better federally qualified um, health center, do, do things, give back to your community. You know, um, they say live like a resident, you know, for as long as you can. That's tough. I mean, we, you can say that. It's just like telling somebody you got to communicate. Mm, I'm communicating, you know, like it's, a, it's like, but without being able to tell people exactly how to do that and why it's important. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is to just live within your means as best as possible. And if you are um, with a, a significant other, try to live off of one salary as, as best you can make decisions off of one salary in case, because oftentimes somebody's going to be without a job at one point or another within, mm -hmm. within that relationship. And so it's just super important to just kind of try and do that, live the best you can. You know, I, I, I definitely, for one, um, you know, love and support um, family members and their thought processes and what they want to do. And you, I want to live, I want a big house. I want all this stuff um, as well, but it wasn't important for me then. But guess what? You know, now I can have that big house if I want to see, right? So I just feel like I, you, you make the commitment up front um, to live like you want to later. Um, and, and now we can live like kings and queens if that's what we want, you know? Um, and let me see, I think I wrote down one more thing. Oh, that signing bonus, I told you that. So put that signing bonus, because most of the time you're gonna get it. So most physicians are gonna get some kind of signing bonus. So put that there. And don't be afraid to negotiate, negotiate. That's another, that's another podcast. Look, have put another one on there about <laughs> how, how to negotiate and, and, and how to, how to lean into what you're worth. So I'm going to tell you, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of people that look like you and I that are doing, that have the skill set that we have, the knowledge that we have. Utilize that because I'm going to tell you, they're going to utilize it. So, you know, <laughs> so you should capitalize on it because somebody else is already going to do that. Mm -hmm. And people will travel miles around to come and see you because you are unique. We're unicorns for a reason. So we should be treated as such. And so learn how to negotiate that and utilize your uniqueness. All right. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I, I agree with all of it. <laughs> yes, I mean, like with everything she said, is, is um, I agree with everything as far as um, consolidating and we talk about in the refinancing and signing bonuses and whatnot um and just find other means of now it doesn't have to be just your doctor's salary you know like toya dr kelly said she did other things outside of that and for me i've gone into a, a sales in the podiatry but a, a small niche where i'm the only one in atlanta who does it so i'm capitalizing on that and marketing myself as that so that way I don't have to be dependent on insurance companies. You know, I'm, I'm building a skill set where I can do surgeries out of the office and I don't have to be dependent on what the insurance company says I'm worth. You know, I can charge what I want for a bunion surgery. And because I have a special skill set that no one else has, if you want the way I do it, you'll pay what I charge, you know, or you'll go and get whatever else, you know, you can get. So I've, I've gotten that level of confidence in, in what I'm building and what I'm working on so that I can set myself up in 10 years or so where I can work three days a week and still make the same kind of money and not have to see 50 patients a day. You know, so as you go in your career, you start to find your niche, what's in, what makes you special and what you can finally say, this is, is going to be my legacy um, in the end. And this is how I'm going to end up paying my bills and keeping the the lifestyle that I want and not have to be that stressed out doctor who's, you know, 65, 70, doesn't know when they can retire, but they've been in practice 30 years, you know, because <laughs> they're still out there, you know, <laughs> the doctors who are still working at 70 who don't really want to, but they have to, you know, so you don't want to be that person, you know, um, and so starting out early and figuring out where, how you can kind of, kind of get around that, that vicious cycle and get out of that circle um, is key as well. 
Thank you both. So this has been so encouraging because I told you guys, I like looked at my, like, I just looked at my dad and was just like, <laughs> how is this going to be possible? Like, it sounds like no matter which pathway I choose, whether it's like kind of being more aggressive or not, like, it's very possible. I've learned that obviously you have to strategize and plan accordingly. Things will work out. It also sounds like it is worth it. Because I think the original reason why I decided to start this like mini series was to find out, is it even really worth it? Is this 200,000 plus worth <laughs> of debt? Is this like, is it worth it in the end? So it's really great and like insightful just to kind of hear your different perspectives and to see that it's still, it's still going to work out and it's like, it's very possible. So I wanted mm -hmm. to thank you both for your time. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to quickly say before we kind of wrap up this session but um anything you wanted to share or like pub because i know there's some side gigs going on but you can, you can use that to do this really quickly and then we'll just kind of end mm -hmm. um no i mean i don't my, my biggest thing is just just stay true to yourself um everyone who's listening to this or a part of this um podcast or, or chiming in has some love or interest in medicine and if it's a true love and it's truly your in your heart's desire to help people and to see people feel better and do better then harness that um in every decision you make financial or not and things will work out they'll work themselves out just be smart about what you're doing the money you're taking out the money you're spending um and it'll work itself out like I said, I don't, I don't lose the sleep at night over the bills. I have to pay the loan payments. You know, it's there. I make it work. <laughs> and so uh, it, it's, it, it will all work itself out. So it, it's definitely still worth it in the end, I would say. Agreed. Definitely worth it. Um, definitely worth it. And it's, very, it's a very fulfilling career. So um, whatever you're deciding to go into, whatever that passion is, whatever you're driven to do, we need that. So put that energy out there into the world and go go forth and, and we'll be here to support you. And so if you um, have any questions or just would like to, to talk or chat, I am um, not the biggest social media person. Um, I, I have on my vision board this year to get better at that. So um, I, I do have a Twitter, it's um, at Toya Kelly MD. And so that's Tango Oscar Yankee Alpha. Kilo Echo, Lima Lima Echo, Yankee MD. So Toya Kelly, because that's K-E-L-L-E-Y, MD. That's my Twitter. Um, and then as if you love to travel and you love to travel in style and would love to have a physician um, discuss the public health risk or concerns wherever you're traveling, then you can hit me up on Bucket List Destinations. And so that's um, www.bldtravel.com. Um, so bldtravel.com and I would love to help you meet your travel goals so thank you again for having me here and I appreciate it yeah thank you and I, I was put out my social media I'm on Instagram mostly um my um Instagram is Dr. Dr. Uh, Goodfoot ATL um so if you had any questions you can always look for me on Instagram and I answer questions. People send me pictures of x-rays and feet and stuff all the time or <laughs> random stuff. And, and I answer questions. So yeah, I'm there if you have any, if you need anything. Awesome. Thank you both again so much for your time. They've shared their contact information. So feel free guys to like ask questions, like, comment, and subscribe this, to this channel if you haven't already and stay tuned for a lot more. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye.